I would easily be mistaken for a girl. This young child wearing a beautiful dress and fancy shoes. We could easily mistake it for a girl today. If it were not Franklin D. Roosevelt, the one-time president of the United States of America as a child. Back in that day, it was common in America and much of the West for both boys and girls to wear dresses until a certain age. After all, a young child is going to grow every year. And it makes more sense to have that young child wear a dress than have to buy a whole lot of new trousers every single time they grow a little bit. In today's world, that's less of a problem. Clothing is cheap and easier to come by. But to Franklin D. Roosevelt's parents, it made more sense to follow the common cultural practice of having boys wear dresses. And at that time, one trade journal described pink as a vibrant colour suitable for boys and blue as a perfect colour for a young girl. Both of these ideas might be somewhat surprising to modern ears. Though pink really is just a light red. It doesn't appear just as a light red to modern ear, of course. Or to modern eye. The high-heeled shoe came from cavalry shoes and entered men's fashion, whereby men would wear their high-heeled shoes and their tights and walk about. Women soon thought that it was a great fashion for them to follow as well, and so more intricate and feminine high-heeled shoes were developed for women as well. And around the French Revolution, such shows of wealth, which they were, fell out of fashion, and while you might have noticed a king or a lord wear his high-heeled shoes at one point in history, at a certain later point it fell completely out of fashion. Until, of course, the Second World War, when pinup girls would wear high heel shoes to show their legs, and pornography made high heel shoes on women much more fashionable again. To an extent that nowadays high heel shoes are quite fashionable among most women, and women even get into trouble for not wearing them in some workplaces. You then have things such as makeup. Well, in ancient Egypt, men would wear makeup, and in certain other societies and cultures, they would. And in ancient Greece, a woman who wore makeup was seen as someone who, or who at least wore too much makeup, that it became noticeable that she was, would be considered to be improper, immoral, just as a Victorian woman who would wear um, nail polish might be considered immoral and improper, and. Women in Shakespeare's time could not appear on stage, so they would dress little boys as the female characters, and it was fine until their voice broke, and then obviously that was not so fine. In fact, Shakespeare was complimented on how much the Juliet appeared female on stage. In Africa, if there is to be water to be gathered, not in all of Africa, but in some cultures, I remember reading a novel, I think it was Wild Things or something. It was a series of books about animals and people interacting with animals in Africa. But two of the main male characters in a certain book caused a village to laugh at them because they volunteered to carry the water from the river for the women to impress the women. And the women thought, well, this is women's work. This is not something men should be doing. And yet, if there were water to be gathered from a river in a Western society, you'd probably send your men, as they are probably stronger to be able to carry the water than your women would be. And I don't mean that as a stereotype, but I'll get to that a bit later, hopefully. So, we have a lot of ideas of roles of gender which we get from our current society. For instance, you also have the idea of wigs and long hair in Europe. Men during the Renaissance would often wear very long hair. And a figure who was of importance in the government would often have a very long wig which they'd wear. So 
you have this idea in nowadays that short hair is what a man must wear and yet at certain times in history it's not the case it's not what you have you have men with their long hair and possibly wearing tights and other such things and it might seem very humorous to a modern perspective to see these tough ancient men dressed in a manner which isn't so tough by modern standards you might see an ancient Roman soldier wearing his leather dress, his leather skirt, sorry. Or you might see many other figures doing things which to modern eye are not so compliant with our gender roles. And there's a problem with our modern gender roles and it's that we've created such strict gender roles that if a boy were to like pink dresses a century or so ago it would just be, okay well He's liking what any of the other boys are wearing and what he's wearing too. But if a boy nowadays does, we're told, oh, that means that he's a girl. That's a very, very strict and almost tyrannical gender norm that you're creating. It's this idea that any non-compliance with a gender role means that that person is not part of the biological sex which they might belong to. And with children, this is dangerous because the human brain only develops fully at age 26. And there are certain consequences of that. For instance, with homosexual individuals, when they reach 26, by the time they reach 26, most have ceased to be homosexual. They sort of become heterosexual for some reason. So the brain at a certain stage has one way of looking at things, but when it's finished the work of evolution, it looks at it a different way at that age. And when it comes to a lot of different things, such as what a boy likes until the age of puberty, well, puberty hasn't acted on him yet, has it? Now, in Las Salinas, in the Dominican Republic, one in every 90 boys is born as a girl and only becomes a boy at age 12 when puberty hits. Now, this may seem spectacular to Western eyes until you realize that in the womb we all are conceived and have the appearance of girls and we gradually the boys will develop their organs in the womb and so we can identify it as a boy at a certain stage of a pregnancy before that a boy and a girl would look much the same now these boys develop it at about 12 and there's often a wise name change which occurs and it's then a boy, but it's a boy at the stage when it needs to be a boy to genetically succeed. It's a boy at the stage when puberty starts beginning. Now, let's imagine for a moment that the boys who like dresses are like girls who played as tomboys until they reach puberty. Imagine it's like that. Now, you're putting a child through very specific things as a result of that. You are socializing them in a certain way. You are maybe directing their socialization rather than letting them socialize themselves. And there's something called uh, puberty blockers which have been brought out recently and they existed to prevent early puberty which is important. But if you're de delaying puberty in an ordinary child there are certain problems to be encountered because the brain develops through puberty. Both men and women's brains develop through puberty. A boy's heart will become larger due to puberty. Their lungs will become larger due to puberty. Their veins will become larger due to puberty. They'll gain more muscle, more dense bones. And a lot of what it is to be a man is developed from our hormones at puberty and the same goes for women and we often hear oh sex sexuality is a spectrum but that's not what our genetics reveal they reveal that bisexuality is incredibly rare homosexuality after that is quite rare as well but when two twins are raised apart if one is homosexual there's a statistically significant likelihood that the other one will be as well and it's not greater or less than that likelihood, it falls at that likelihood, which suggests that there's a gene combination which when it expresses itself in a certain way when the genes are forming the neural pathways in the womb, 
results in homosexuality, or at least temporary homosexuality in some cases, and permanent in others. So that someone who is straight, like me, and doesn't really have any homosexual relatives in their gene line that they know of of their relatives, is not someone who is likely to um, have that attraction, while someone who comes from a certain gene line is much more likely, statistically, to have that attraction. And a lot is genetic, but the male brain and the female brain, if you look at certain metrics, then it's like, oh well, there's only something like 6% entirely male or female brains, but that's looking at things without looking at multivariant reasoning about the brain. When you look at multiple variants, it becomes very clear whether someone has a male or a female brain. And men will have male brains and women will have female brains in that sense of the multivariant sort of looking at it. Obviously also the physical brain is often quite different and men will often have larger skulls than women would have and they'd have their brains function in different ways and focus towards different things. That's not every man, but generally speaking, men and women have brains which, if you look at the overall variants rather than just one variant or another, come out as male or female. Interestingly enough, at least to me, people who are transsexual, who believe they are in the wrong body, a few of them would actually uh, be people who are intersex in a certain way and are more likely to believe they are the other sex, like certain women because of a inability of the body to properly process the DNA to create the testosterone or absorb it, would come out as women and spend their lives as women while they in fact had a Y chromosome and they're more likely to have um, to be homosexual and certain other things despite the fact that they came out as women. But generally speaking, transsexuals don't have a brain of the opposite sex. What they have is a brain which resembles other transsexuals' brains, which is very interesting because it indicates again a difference and possibly a, dif a difference in neurodevelopment which might well result from certain genes just like homosexuality is thought to result from neurodevelopment combined with certain genes at least when it's a permanent thing often it's something which is temporary and is not a permanent thing and of course just as you have some very famous people who were heterosexual their whole lives and then suddenly are homosexual you identify as man their whole lives and suddenly at 60 or something suddenly identify as woman it's very likely that in our modern society where we consider things which are different in those areas to be better in some parts of our societies that many people identify as something which they don't necessarily genetically or neurodevelopmentally develop to be so it might be something which is ingrained or something which they have as a habit that's possibility. So we have a complex sort of system with human beings and before you say that you know society is judgmental, it is, it, it always has been, but something very very strange is that the suicide and suicidal thoughts, uh, the rates of them with people who belong to the LGBT community are very very high. And with transsexuals, it's even very high after transition, and it's very high even in societies which are very accepting, at least in the perception of the people asked about it. And a very high proportion of LGBT people are homeless in the West. They make up a massive proportion of it. So we may believe that our simple solutions to these problems as a Western society are solutions which have solved the problems. You might think, oh, we've introduced, uh, let's say, gay marriage in this country, or that country, or we've introduced this or that other law, or we say that any doctor who questions whether or not a child really is the opposite gender of what they claim to be is doing bad to them, doing violence to them, and we make sure that's a person can transition, that person still has a very high chance of committing suicide. So whatever's going on with the brain and this 
DNA and its neurodevelopment and everything else involved, and whether it has anything to do with neurodevelopment or society or human nature or specific societies, what we're doing with people who don't fit into our very strict gender norms in the West is not necessarily to their benefit. And you see that in lifespans being much shorter for people who don't fit very clearly in one end or another. You see that in the high likelihood of suicide among people in those groups in accepting societies when they're given everything they want. And not just in societies where they're condemned. You see something unusual happening. Now, getting on to intersex people, people who are not one sex or the other, we'd say, but generally speaking, it results from specific genetic mutations. And so we do know which sex those people are more than the other. We do know the results of it because it specifically comes out in certain ways. You know whether or not someone's likely to have an internal womb or not. And that's generally something which is very, very much um, something which will affect which gender you'd class someone to be as, as a young child if they had that. And intersex people are very likely to be infertile, to not be able to pass on their specific genes when they otherwise would have if they were not intersex. And so it's specific genetic results which you're talking about, but an intersex person will almost always or always seem to be more male or female biologically, however they identify in the brain or otherwise. So what's the solution? Well, I think that it's very important that we distinguish between what's biological, what's sex, and what we consider to be gender or gender norms. Just because a boy likes dresses doesn't mean that he's a girl. Just because a girl likes playing in the mud, playing with cars, or a boy likes playing with Barbies or action figures, which is the male version of a Barbie, doesn't mean that they're the opposite gender. I think it's very important that we respect people's development of their brains as they develop until age 26 when their brain is fully developed. I think we need to be very careful of placing permanent solutions on people when we might in fact be creating a situation with that person which is not what they themselves would want if they were of an age to decide for themselves. And I think it's very important that as a society we learn to judge not with ideology, not with what we think is best for society as a whole, but rather let individuals judge their own circumstances and people close to them judge their circumstances in a way which doesn't necessarily have such permanent consequences for them until such an age as they are prepared to take those permanent consequences upon themselves. I think our ancestors, they believed that vanity was one of the greatest sins human beings could have. And for our modern society, we seem to think that vanity is one of the greatest virtues a man can have. We periodically reach for the sky like the ancients did in building the Tower of Babel. We periodically believe, well, we have technology, we can change things. A woman who doesn't like her looks can get plastic surgery and then she's a new woman. But the problem with this self-determination, this, this vanity, this pride in our own intellects, is that we possibly are causing people who are in the shadows between two different places to encounter the darkness and not light, to encounter a society which is pushing down on them so hard that they cannot get up, rather than a society which is gentler and a society which is less prepared to make permanent judgments about something which may just be an expression of the self rather than ex an expression of some or other imagined gender which may exist or may not, but sex definitely exists, but the idea that a boy carrying water would be a girl 
is one which needs to be looked out for and which we need to be careful of.